Terry Liu. Uh, I uh, got my degree in violin performance in 1979, I think. And, um, uh, but by then I had already been feeling that there was a lot more than to the answer to the question that I asked my uh, brilliant conductor, Dwight Oldman at Baldwin Wallace College Conservatory of Music. I asked him, what is music? And Dwight Altman said it's a musical utterance and things like that. But um, I had felt that being uh, trained in a conservatory of music and um, playing in uh, orchestra and Bach festivals, he, Dwight Altman was cor correct. We were, we were to be stewed in the tradition. So I was stewed in the tradition of uh, Western music, you know. And uh, but by then I had already been thinking. Well, there are other kinds of music uh, because my mom and dad, my mom was born and raised here in Kauai where I live now. And, you know, she had Japanese records and uh, my uh, father was from China. You know, they met here in Kauai and during the war, but uh, he had his Chinese records, none such records and such. <laughs> and um, I would listen to all these, including there was a Gagaku album that my mom had. And uh, then I, uh, so I started becoming very interested in what was going on in China while I was in high school already. Um, I was following uh, things going on in the People's Republic of China. And when Nixon went to China, I remember watching with my dad sitting on the couch. There was a live broadcast from, from I guess it was Beijing. And uh, there was Zhang Jing, Mao, Mao Zedong's wife, and uh, Zhou Enlai, I think, and Mr. and Mrs. Nixon watching a ballet, The Red Detachment of Women. Mm -hmm. And so I started collecting all these albums of music from um, the People's Republic of China, as long, along with, um, you know, uh, English language versions of communist literature from our popular bookstores. <laughs> and um, so I, I, had been, I realized that there was music of the rest of the world. And then in the midst of almost getting my, my uh, bachelor's degree in violin performance, I had a chance to meet finally William Maul, who came to Cleveland uh, Art Museum and gave a lecture on Japanese music and he played the shakuhachi and everything. And I had told him, you know, I was so, I was interested in studying world music, uh, ethnomusicology, I had already learned the term. And he encouraged me and I had written um, sort of my own study on the history of Chinese music and sent that off to um, University of Hawaii and other places. But it was a Rick Tremilos uh, at the University of Hawaii who answered my letter and said, okay, why don't you come to Hawaii? Which was great, you know, because I had roots here. My sister was actually living here at the time. And so that's how I, I my master's degree was in ethnomusicology. And then I, after, I actually wrote my master's uh, thesis on uh, music from the Cultural Revolution, um, the, the Red Lantern. And... Um, then I uh, went back to Ohio where I grew up and went to Kent State University and became an ethnomusicologist there. So that's how, how I got into ethnomusicology. Barbara Smith, who created the program at the University of Hawaii, got, she got there in the 40s. She just passed away last year at the age of 100 and I think she made it to 101 and we had this great celebration for her on her 100th. People from all around the world had, uh, you know, uh, given papers, and you know, she had made comments from her, uh, from her uh, Zoom link. But uh, she, you know, at University of Hawaii, she set up this program. The ethnomusicology in you know, in a state a place like Hawaii, had to pay attention to the musical traditions that the students were bringing. And at that time, she was teaching lots of students uh, from uh, Micronesia and, and Hawaii as well, and Japan, Japanese students and. You know, she became the first one to play a taiko <laughs> and, and uh, Hawaii, things like that. So she was a tremendous influence on me on, on the role of an ethnomusicologist. And of course, uh, her protege, Rick Chimilos, you know, uh, reinforced that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I went to Kent State University and became a little bit more traditional ethnomusicology and, you know, went to China to do my research, which ended up being on the Arhu and um, under uh, Terry Miller. But Terry Miller also was uh, very interested in um, folk culture. You know, he had uh, a take on um, studying the music 
all around us. And he used to take us to um, old regular Baptist churches, you know, and in the middle of the winter, I remember once, you know, we went on a field trip to somewhere in Ohio and the people had cut a hole in the ice. The ice was about, you know, four inches thick. They cut a hole in the ice to do a baptism. So my ethnomusicology um, training in Kent State University further reinforced me, in me the sense that, um, yes, you should go around the world to study music, but you should also be aware that all around you there is music. Uh, I can't remember exactly what year it was, but it was when the SEM meeting was in Boston. Mm -hmm. And I had gone down with some of my Chinese uh, uh, scholar friends um, or people who focused on China, including, you know, and then we went to uh, uh, the SEM meeting. We stayed at Rulin Chao Tian's house. <laughs> I remember that was a, a wonderful moment in my life. And then uh, uh, I was at the meeting and Terry Miller, who was my uh, doctoral um, advisor came, hey, Terry, go down to this room down there. There's Bess Lomax Haas and Dan Sheehy are looking for someone to uh, hire at the National Endowment for the Arts. And they want somebody with Asian uh, specialty, classical, you know, and well, it's folk. So I went down there and interviewed, you know, uh, what's, you know, I could possibly get a job. I, at that time I was uh, working in, I had finished my doctoral I had already become, um, got my PhD and I was, I think I was working at Arby's <laughs> because Dan Sheedy had to call me during a break on Arby's. And so I was in Arby's and he was saying, uh, why don't you come back for, to uh, Washington DC, start, it, start working for us in January. So uh, January, 1990 is when I started working for the National Endowment for the Arts in the Folk and Traditional Arts program that Bess Lomax Haas and Dan Sheehy built. In, in the early 1990s, or maybe the mid 1990s, by the uh, early 1990s, we uh, the NEA decided to convene a, a meeting. Uh, Bess and Dan convened a meeting with some outstanding ethnomusicologists. Like, there's a, just a list of them would be fascinating. But they all came to talk about whether the NEA should change the program's name from folk arts to something else, because you know there's music like uh, Cambodian music, Samang uh, Sam was one of the people on it. And uh, should, maybe it should be uh, include classical or something like that. So I think we finally decided that folk and traditional arts was the name that it should take. So, because everything's a tradition and it, whether it's uh, folk or whether it's uh, classical or court based. And so um, that was a fascinating meeting, the, the meeting of bringing those, all those people together and uh, then uh, I, I, you know, in process of looking at projects that are applying for uh, grants, you know, I realized that I had gone to China, uh, you know, to do my research, thinking that, you know, there isn't any uh, Chinese this music isn't being, um, there's no Chinese music in America. And how wrong I was, because I we were getting applications from, you know, Chinese opera companies in Washington, D.C. and, you uh, um, and of course, the Cambodian uh, Samang Sam uh, and uh, Chan Mo Lee were were really uh, amp amping up the uh, the movement to keep tradition of Cambodian classical dance passed on from generation to generation. All these things were happening, and uh, and I got to uh, realize how rich there are traditions it's just in the United States alone. And then it reinforced, reminded me of what. Barbara Smith had taught me so many years ago at University of Hawaii and Terry Miller, you know, taking us to uh, 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 old regular Baptist churches and the end, and then so many covered bridge tours, you know, that's something that he was a passion, that there's culture in the United States of America that people have brought here, uh, as well as, you know, Hawaiian native um, culture that's still here and, uh, uh, in Native American culture and for generations and generations. And this is what the mission of Bess Hawes and, and Dan Shi was to, uh, to re first of all, recognize that it was there. And if the NEA is gonna be the National Endowment for the Arts, it had to have a program to support these tradition bearers as well. And so I worked there from 1990 roughly to uh, 2016 
there was three years that I took off because of the Republican Revolution. I lost my job along with 90 other people, but that gave me an opportunity to work as a folk arts coordinator in the state of California. And, I, and that was another great moment because I realized, you know, what it is to work in the field and support artists uh, in Southern California was my area. And um, at that time, um, Amy Kitchener, she's a folklorist, UCLA graduate, who was also working in, in the Fresno area. And we, and together with, uh, we started a, a, an organization called um, Alliance for California Traditional Arts, which still exists today. It's a, a great organization, this model organization of how a or nonprofit organization can work with the State Arts Council to support folk and traditional arts throughout the state. David Roach was also the third member who, who helped put this together. David Roach, you know, an ethnomusicologist uh, involved in, um, in, at that time, in pre presenting, you know. These are the kind of people that I, I had the opportunity to, to learn from. I think of people like um, Barbara Smith, you know, who changed the direction of uh, the music program at the University of Hawaii, or Bess Lomax has, that individually changed the way that arts funding from the United in the US government single-handedly, she and, 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 and Dan Sheehy, one person can make a difference, you know? And so I don't know I, if I'll ever make that big of an impact as uh, Barbara Smith or, or Bess Haas or, even, or Dan Sheehy, you know? I, by the way, I played in Dan Sheehy's mariachi too, you know? I talk about someone who, who worked so hard to, uh, make an impact on so many things. You know, Dan is just amazing. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I'll ever make the kind of impact that they, they have, but uh, I feel that dedicated to the, the work and do everything I can. Right now, besides working in arts retail, which is very good, I help pay the bills and I, and I can transfer over the way that I talk about artists and art forms when people come in the store. Um, I'm also helping a project in Hanapepe, not far from here, where my mom was born and raised in the McBride Sugar Plantation. And there's a temple there called the Soto Zen uh, Buddhist Temple. And they have, you know, on Kauai, there's always Bonadori every summer, but um, they have uh, the Soto Zen, this is, uh, they have focused on outreach that when people come, they invite people to come to Bonadori and then try to have, help them understand what's going on and what, uh, how Japanese emigrated to Hawaii for, uh, to work on sugarcane and um, holy holy bushi is what we're, we're working on for uh, 2023 Bonadori. You know, there are three young women here in Hawaii that learn holy holy bushi. They're in the thirties and twenties and um, they want to pass it on to uh, another generation. So we're bringing here them uh, we're going to have them do workshops and so <laughs> still involved and this is not something that i did it's something that's organically happening then and i i have an opportunity to you know help assist in you know helping articulate the language and grant writing and stuff like that but as you know it's 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 organic you know the my role in it is just uh, to uh, help and um, then maybe I can be one of the meters and greeters so when people come I can invite them to consider oh so this so this is Bonadori and this is what it means Japan maybe this you have some traditions that how do you celebrate you know things like this maybe it's um, Dia de los Muertos or it's some or something else you know mm -hmm. and um, you know make make a relationship and that's kind of what applied ethnomusicologists I think can do always do. Mm 